shows uh, the ratio of the relationship between products like uh, the car, which has a lot of recall and you know, the efficiency of the time. And he said we're not able to find any, any system that, that showed less efficiency over time. You remember that? Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Less energy. Sure. Less, uh, less, well, less energy efficiency. Yes, that's one here. Well, okay. Um, well, what I mean by not able to find, I, I mean, I, I didn't do exhaustive research, that's what I mean. Uh, there probably are examples. Uh, this particular study seemed to fit, you know, the question of, the, of our gathering here today, and it covered a lot of what we call our, I think of as a material economy. And um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but, you know, their study, just happened to show that uh, all these various, um, uh, you know, measures, things that arguably increase in efficiency, happen to correlate, go alongside, associated with increases in consumption. So that's that's rebound, I guess, or or not. <laughs> Oh, you know, it's a good question. I guess the question is, are there examples where things were less efficient? The, I guess my thing is, what do you mean? What type of efficiency? And there probably are. Um, it would be good, good to look. I mean, if you, look, if you get a chance to get that paper, they actually show each of those dots, they show separate graphs over decades of what happened. And there were times when things did get less, uh, consumption went down, and there's, you know, you see different, variations over decades and, and they try and make some inference about it which <clears throat> you know try some you know what does this mean or what can we learn from it and I guess the one thing one takeaway I got from the article is something I already believed so I was ready to believe it is that our policies matter you know our policies influence what happens and they were talking about instances where you had maybe increases in efficiency and decrease in consumption. They tried to say, well, the rules that our society was playing by, the, the policies in place had something to do with it. I don't Anyway, yeah, thanks. Um, sorry, I, there was, uh, I wanted to get add something after the 18-wheeler trucks because I know that's completely ridiculous. But there are simpler ways and really, really easy ways you can add a labor efficiency in, sorry, a labor inefficiency back into the system to compensate for the efficiencies, the labor efficiencies from elsewhere in the economy. Um, a good example is organic farming because you can't just cover the crops full of pesticide. You have to add more labor for a given output. Your labor, uh, the labor, it's a tricky word, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I've been dealing with it for many years, but the labor, like the labor inefficiency of having more people grow a potato or something. Um, you're employing people that are not rebounding into growth. Or another example is more teachers in a classroom. Uh, you're improving a quality of life. Or another example is more healthcare workers for a given set of patients. Instead of treating people like they're in a factory, maybe take some time to have a conversation with the patient. Have that ability. More people employed, quality of life increases, without increasing production and consumption. I was going to make the comment that I think um, it'd be very interesting on those time series of um, increased consumption to look in each case how prices varied over that time and how incomes varied over that time. Because those, I think, are the two you know, there are all kinds of, uh, of uh, ver independent variables you can put into a demand function. The trouble when you're doing statistical work is that eventually your estimates, your regression um, coefficients mean nothing because you've got so many explanatory variables that obviously you get a very good fit, but, but you have no idea what's going on and everything's intercorrelated with everything else and you've just got a jumble. So you really want to try and be strategic and certainly all this kind of two-dimensional analytical work is done with price as the key driver. 
but income is another one that, that's key. If you can control for income and for price, I think you'd kind of get a better idea. I, statistically, that's probably quite difficult to do over time, and when the technologies change, so even the product isn't the same at the beginning and the end of the time series. But I think you'll find that that's, that's a, a key um, element, and for that reason, the policy prescription that, that I put into my, my proposal was that, that in order to, to not be defeated by the Germans' paradox, uh, we, we should be accepting the idea that for every efficiency we gain, we've got to kind of tax ourselves. I don't think we really need to tax ourselves by pushing redundant labor into the equation, although I agree with Conrad that if the labor, if, if retaining more labor gives a better product, as in teaching or organic farming, or if we adopted a zero tolerance policy on litter in the cities and employed hundreds of people, uh, thousands of people to pick it all up, um, or to watch everybody else and catch the people who are dropping it in the first place, which I would prefer to paying people to pick it up, would be to catch the offenders who dropped it. But those kinds of labor intensive things are probably a good idea socially, but they're all public goods, so you need to have the political will to invest in them. But. Um, but the point, I think, is that we have to accept that when we have a technological improvement, instead of seeing it as an opportunity to get richer, we should see it as an opportunity to give back through the tax system and buy more public goods of a, of a, of a high value. Uh, okay, well, I'll start with uh, John. Two comments. again, to do a lot with the Great Depression. But I feel that the single thing why it is in North America that we are so far behind in investing in social good is the work week. If you do a correlation between the countries with the shortest hours of work and income inequality, it's the countries that have the shortest hours of work that are the more egalitarian. And the countries with the longest hours of work have the biggest gap between, uh, biggest income disparity. 
And the reason is, here in North America, we're all working so hard, we're chasing the dollar, everybody needs to make a buck, um, that people don't really have the time anymore for investing in social good, education. Uh, people don't know anymore. In countries where people have time to find out what's going on, you have more of an empowered society, a society that can challenge politicians, challenge corporations. Over here, everybody's just chasing the dollar to stay alive. My beginning, my, I believe the biggest obstacle to ecological sustainability is the work week. We need to get people empowered again. Working across, and then red. Okay. Yeah. We Canadians and Americans are, are using twice as much energy. Well, that's, that's amazing. And I think we have to know why that is, really, before we know anything. So, but since that question's already been taken, I, I, I wanted to pose another having to do with the... I, I mean, I love the idea of overcoming the, the Jevons paradox by adjusting social costs once, a, once an, an efficiency is introduced, adjusting social costs so that so that the paradox doesn't come into play. Um, but my question is, what would be, it's a political question, what, what is the, where would be the constituency for that? The constituency, in other words, who, who is gonna pay money to make that happen? Oh, would you wanna go first, Eric? No, yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't have an answer. <laughs> I'm not so sure, I'll just preface my response to your question by, by making a comment on, on Conrad's. I'm not quite sure where, which is cause and effect here with the work week and the, and the culture. And I think the culture and the politics are, are very related and maybe a sociologist or a psychologist can tell, maybe a cultural historian can tell us something about the grip of the, the that kind of competitive work, the kind of macho work, work ethic that says I'm worth more than you because I'm busier and because I, sp I spend more time at work. But I think we need to tackle that, but I think we also need to tackle the idea that access to cheap resources is a kind of a right or that it's even a good thing. We tend to, most of our elected politicians, and I'm afraid to say probably even some on our so-called progressive political parties, would say that cheaper resources is a good thing because we can then make more stuff and sell it to other countries and then we can be better off. But of course the better off means have more possessions, <laughs> filling our basements and <laughs> overcrowding our houses and becoming a, a pain to deal with. So I think it, we, we, economic literacy is a good part of this, or ecological economic literacy. That's I guess why my activism role, I, that's what I've chosen to put my energy into teaching ecological economics, get people to disconnect the idea that more money equals, equals necessarily equals more happiness. I mean, people have to choose how much money they're happy with, but, but, but also the idea that the quality of what you're able to buy and the quality of what you're able to do with your time matters more than the quantity, and that having everything cheaper is, is not a good idea, that some of the most valuable things to have are things that we can't have personally, we can only have them collectively. That would be like a good education system, a, a good social life, good community, and healthy wildlife. I mean, healthy wildlife matters to me enormously. I would tax, if I could be sure that, that a doubling of my tax rate would lead to all gains in ecosystem services, I think I'd sign up. Does it sell? Uh, I'll just offer an opinion about political processes and just purely an opinion is, it, Somehow, you know, you mentioned elected officials, uh, and it does seem elected officials at all levels, you know, local, regional boards, provincial here, and, and national level, you know, they do make really important decisions. And my, my opinion is that somehow those, I view those as jobs, being an elected official, somehow needs to be made more appealing. Somehow needs to get um, people in there with maybe somehow to be more effective. Because, you know, it's easy to, sit on the side and poke, poke at our elected officials, and it's a privilege to do that. Uh, you know, that we you know, don't have 
direct repercussions, I guess, but somehow that's my opinion. I don't know what the solution is, but it'd be nice if those jobs were more appealing somehow because it seems it's not actually a very attractive job to me, you know, to be publicly scrutinized for very little money, lose all your privacy and so on. Eric raises the key word effectiveness versus efficiency. Uh, we focus, and this is a problem of economists really, not ecological economists, we focus on money. Money is a key issue in efficiency. If you monetize everything, well, what are you valuing? Money. And obviously more work can conceivably create more money, more flow, and everyone wants that. Governments get more taxes and people have more money to spend. And if that's all you're using as your justification for any policy decision, well, then you're gonna get more money. And that's a, I think it's a North American uh, you know, nightmare. But in any case, that's where we are. Uh, actually, right in black. Yeah, sure, go ahead, please. Uh, just a quick story. Uh, again, I keep running in, uh, telling people you've got to reduce the work. Just as, an, just as an example, one of the countries that does have one of the lowest hours of work, Norway. Um, and they had this before all the oil resources there, we're privatized. You see, they have a, had a society that could say, oh, you want to take these resources and give them to corporations? We don't think so. We'll protest. That ain't going to happen. The politicians that got into power were, peop were voting in by an empowered society. Now, they can afford uh, the reduced work week very easily. Not only that, their fund owns 10% of all the shares in the EU and 5% of all the shares in the world. It's just an example. I think there's a connection with an empowered society. In black, or fine, and then, then you. Yeah. yeah, I think in um, a capitalist market society, the growth effect will always open. Why? Because what drives uh, the economy and accumulation is profitability. Right? Profitability is about labor efficiency decreasing the, the, uh, the cost of labor and commodifying nature, right? So um, just a question. So the problem with the policy approach is that, yeah, it's pretty clear that, um, well, if, if uh, the efficiency effect, um, the growth effect is, is a little bit out of control, then all we do is impose taxes or some sort of disincentives. Well, in our society, in the capitalist society, the power of those of, of the, the private property and corporations is such that that will never happen. You're never going to get large corporations to stop producing fossil fuels until you have, you know, the kind of the situation where the society is more empowered. That's about class sort of that struggle, right? Uh, so there's a problem with the policy orientation. Um, when uh, you say that you can just voluntarily impose certain disincentives to the growth effect. Um, so the, the, the question is more for, for, you, for, for you though, um, Conrad, um, and I, I totally agree with the whole effect, you know, effect and, and, your, and your enthusiasm around um, the efficiency being at the root of the problem is, is beautiful, it's wonderful, and I did read two of your books while back, so there's two people here. So, so thanks for that. It's, it's really good, and I love your, your presentation and your sense of power relationships. My question for you, and I'd really love to sort of discuss this over a beer or something, because I, I still I don't, don't get it. Like, I don't get it. Why? Why? It's not efficiency that, that's you know driving all this. What's the driver of, of the need for efficiency? It's profitability. It's the companies that are in, in control that want the efficiency. That, that need efficiency because of competition. It's not just that it's not just greed, it's not because they want it, because there's systematic reasons in, in a competitive society where individual, uh, you know, uh, private property needs to reduce those costs, needs to create those efficiencies because of profitability. So that's my question to you. What, why do you prioritize just this, this concept of, of, of efficiency over, over um, the real driver, which is profitability? Increasing shareholder value. You see, what I'm trying to say is that I 100% agree with you. On one side, you have profitability. Corporations say, we need to be more efficient. We need to make more money. 
But what I'm saying is we need to push the other side. The other side where people say, hey, I need more time. Hey, I need a better standard of living. I need better education. I need better health care. I need healthy food. No, 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 I don't want the stuff covered in pesticides. I want that organic tomato. You see, those things can't be imposed uh, by the individual. They are systematic changes. But they come from an empowered society that says, yeah, 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 you already said that you wanted more money, but I want that organic tomato. <laughs> See, that's where the empowerment happens. I'm not so sure that we, uh, that we should always accept that the way we see it in, in terms of electoral outcomes is the way it has to be. I mean, we do have um, a relatively democratic constitution, even though uh, the party in power at the federal level seems to be trying to make it less. Uh, um, we do have the right to go, to go and vote, and we do have the right to think our own economic thoughts, and we don't have to accept the corporate gospel about what's good for the economy. And we don't have to define profit the way it's currently defined. And we don't have to commodify parts of nature that we choose not to commodify. We can change all of those things if we can spread the culture that says we're headed in a stupid direction. This is not the way to go. And I don't think it's true that there are no, there's no one to vote for who doesn't take that view. I'll be shamelessly partisan and say there's a, a certain party identified by its color who at least um, at least offers ca some candidates. I, I, I know they're a small party and I always have candidates everywhere and the, their candidates don't always look like they're super experienced. But um, there's a party that's a little more interested in this way of thinking than the other three parties. And, um, and we could also get candidates in the existing parties to, to think more like that. I think you might have a bit of trouble with the party with the blue and red colors, but um, you know, there are other parties where these can be raised. I mean, I think the all red party isn't showing a great deal of interest in this right now, but they could be reminded they're, they're actually a, a party whose principles are reinvented every time there's an election to be fought. So, <laughs> so, so there's a lot of room to influence what they say. And I think the, the orange and green party tends to, um, to also have an environmental wing. So, I mean, I think we can, and they're not hostage to the corporate sector at all. So I, I think we've got to get rid of this idea that we're defeated before we start. Um, let's redefine profit, let's redefine well-being, let's redefine social progress, and let's demand the public goods we think we want. And I don't think we should demand crappy public goods either. We don't just want volume, we want quality. Yeah. Eric, you wanna? No, I wanna hear Don's question. Okay, Don, <laughs> all right, Don, go ahead. how he heard he, has, he doesn't go to work very often. He only works a few days a week because the money's still here. And I said, no, oh, that's interesting. And so I Googled it, and sure enough, that in the United States, longshoremen have a very strong union. And the efficiency came in containers. And instead of fighting it and smashing it with sledgehammers, they said, great idea. Let's do containers where you're going to give us a, a commission on each container we uh, process because we know it's going to be more efficient. And nowadays, the average long-term in the United States earns over $100,000 a year, but there's only 10,000 of them, but there used to be 100,000 of them. And so, and they have turned it into some of the journeys I see they did, and so that's kind of a good thing there. But it's a very narrow example. Most things don't go that way. I just thought it was interesting, the efficiency, a lot of it. can be captured by a lot of the workers. The other one was a study I read a long time ago, and it's to do with the transition, <coughs> the movement, the substitution of goods. And there was a study in Norway, in Oslo, <coughs> took a bunch of families, they paired them based on income and family size, and, and they looked at people that had a car and people that used public transit, and that's how they divided them. And then they looked at their carbon footprint. So you think people that own a car have lower carbon footprint. I do the opposite. Because the people that took public transit had more money, and what did they do with the money? Well, they went to Greece, right? That's what they did with their money, which was very high carbon because they're flying. And so this, it's very interesting how we think, when we look at it narrowly, we think we're reducing carbon, but in fact, we're not because of substitution. So it's not for a great example. Yeah. Excellent example. Yeah. So that, that's, that's beautiful. It's the perfect evidence. Uh, 
for example, the given paradox, right? What's the substitution? You get in a plane. It's very, very cheap to fly. It's frightening to cheap to fly. <laughs> That's why when I talk about conservation, it's like, well, let's define the system and let's make it a policy goal that we're going to limit that consumption. Uh, now, the policies are going to have to change and evolve over time to meet those policy goals. Whatever I suggest or anybody else may or may not achieve that, but it seems like there's, an a, there's been an absence of that goal or any policies to achieve it, so it does not surprise me that our consumption just continues to grow. So we're getting near the end of the evening, and I just wanted to add one little more quagmire to the whole equation. It's Jevons, he always, he's, it's, a, it's a tricky concept, but how do you make those changes? One of the ideas that often comes about tax something. Like take, for example, the carbon tax. You see, if you tax an energy and say, well, or, or, or something, and, you, and that money then goes to, you have to look at, the, look where it goes through the economy. That tax then can be, goes back into consumption. Um, I just wanted to add that it's all part of the Javins paradox, the flow. You look at the consequence. Where does that money go? It goes back into energy intensive stuff. Just wanted to add it. Can I respond to that? Because I'm a great advocate of using the tax system. Um, I think it's very important that we trace the, the life cycle effect of tax revenue and we should, we should very specifically design these taxes that are there to attenuate consumption or to limit the, the quantity of resource throughput. And by the way, we also have the, the other market instrument besides commodity taxation is tradable quotas. You can create a fixed ration of carbon. You could even have a personal carbon quota that everybody had, and you can monetize them so that you get some efficiency. So some people aren't sitting on enormous unused carbon quotas and other people are having a miserable life because they can't do things that would be kind of socially quite helpful because of carbon constraints. So you don't have to, you don't have, to have aggressively rigid egalitarianism about carbon footprints. But you can get the carbon result you want if you have the political will to enact the policies that will get you there. And in the case of taxes, you could take tax activities that have heavy ecological impact and be very deliberate about the fact that they are only going to be spent in ways that do not produce an equal rebound effect. And if they do, then you've got to tax that activity again to stop it. So if you were to tax the private automobile and people to give up their automobiles and then start flying more, then you've got to tax the flying as well. And if they're then going to start eating more meat, then you need to tax the meat. But you've got to find these things that are causing you these social problems and go after them. And you, it's, you're certainly not compatible with the idea that the natural world is ours for the taking and it's an imposition on people's freedom to allow, to stop them using up whatever they can lay their hands on. That kind of thinking has led us to this, the crisis in the oceans where we're about to destroy almost all useful fish species in the next 50 years. Yeah. Any more questions at all? Yes, Phil. Uh, yeah. One thing that really hasn't been brought up oh, yeah. is that that's, um, a lot of what we're talking about is also most of what we're doing economically, production-wise, and everything else, and whether it's a personal investment or an institutional investment, Possibly amazed at how we discussed, you know, these issues. Um, for example, talking about density in the cities and building towers, and it's very logical to do the zoning and build a tower. We very rarely talk about how many people are indebted and they move into them, and the cash flow and the overhead that they're taking on is significantly higher than the more traditional type. Of Structure. And uh, some of the games in Vancouver we see, for example, it was recent purchase of the uh, downtown heating uh, system, the steam heating system, which is reputed to be the most efficient steam heating plant in North America. <laughs> and, and, it was, <laughs> and it was, uh, it was uh, purchased on the basis by, by a condo purchase on the basis that it would comply with Canada with Vancouver's express desire to go to all <coughs> fuels, whereas the former owners were refusing to get off of the natural gas from going 
view. And um, so I, I find that. I think we gotta take that. Eric wants to oh, yeah. that one. Eric wants more, to more interesting than the most recent published report about this developer. I mean, what I'm talking about is privatization of debt and legislation and regulation and how it affects people and who's paying the price. Because this developer in particular bought, I think, 36 blood, blood alley from DHS and failed to vote financially uh, two years ago with the purchase. Hotel. So, a lot of players in this game with that yeah, the efficiency yeah. and public debt. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll keep it. I mean, that's if you're talking about the central heat steam system. Yes. I mean, not to criticize that company or whatever. It's a legacy. That's a really inefficient design, right? Water heats it up, makes steam, <laughs> distributes it, and then that water gets dumped to the sewer. and and the condensate and and you can't actually just directly dump it because it's got too much energy so you have to mix cold water with it so it wastes a lot of energy a lot of water there's no you know well anyway it's a, it, if it's if it the under, my understanding if that system is to be phased out in favor of you know, a hot water system that yeah. recirculates the water and doesn't dump it all then it would be a huge improvement energy wise District energy specifically. <laughs> to share something I might know, uh, I don't know about the business model or whatever of uh, or the specific utilities you're talking about. District energy can, under some designs and compared to whatever you want to compare it to, can be, you know, a, a wise way to use energy and, and to meet energy needs for energy services. Um, you know, it, you can do it with low heat, you know, with little uh, energy. You can incorporate renewables through geo exchange. You can take somebody's waste heat and resell it to somebody else for their heating system. Uh, you, you, by centralizing it, you can do something you can't do when every single facility, a household, a condo, uh, whatever, is, you know, if, if somehow you can find a, a, a more, you know, environmentally friendly fuel, you have a central location where you can substitute more readily. So you know, there's some benefits, but nothing is ever a slam dunk. Always a winner, in my opinion. You got to kind of look at the details. But you know, phasing out the old central heat system—it's hard to imagine how that can't be a winner somehow. Okay. Yeah, you want to live upstairs, upstairs from a pizzeria or a bakery, depending on when you want the heat. But anyway, question in the front. <laughs> Very good. And I have to say, I, I really liked Eric's comment that we're really talking, and, and it's not just comment, but definition of, uh, of conservation. We're talking about pure truth here, and defining things is really important. We also have in the audience John Petrie sitting in the red uh, uh, scarf, a person who wrote an excellent paper on, uh, on, on the post-truth world. We live in a, in a world where, okay, you go to the end of the steam tunnel and you get to the gas, uh, the, the, sorry, the steam uh, 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 clock in Gastown, and uh, yeah, it pumps out steam. It seems to work on steam. Well, it's plugged in. It's running off electric uh, power. <laughs> you you look up at Grass Mountain, and, and it's just amazing how you you drive into Vancouver and you see this. Uh, you know, we actually actually have some wind power here. It seems, and it occasionally seems to be turning. Well, it will never make as much energy as it took to build. That's a fact. <laughs> And they make they make their money on tours, uh, wine, cheese tastings in 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 the uh, in the eye of the world. Or, uh, anyway, it, it's insane. We have in Vancouver a mayor who went to Copenhagen and declared that Vancouver was Kyoto compliant. There is no data to support that. Just as there's no data to support that the, the steam heat is at, at all energy efficient, let alone any more efficient than a, a, a small heater, natural gas fired or electric that. Uh, can, can run at a, probably about 20% greater efficiency. And that's a good thing, but why invest in that when you can do better? 
Um, but in any case, that's uh, great. Uh, it's great to have a good audience like this and good questions. And uh, we're just about on time, 9 o'clock. So uh, we can uh, break for beer after this, perhaps. Oh, that's yeah. the best idea. <laughs> Locally brewed only. <laughs>